Hi, uh, so I'm Irena. Uh, and before I get started with this talk, I just want to say uh, I was one of the organizers of EGX Prague and about a year ago. And so I'm just really um, uh, pleased to be here. And it's great what the organizers were able to do here. So I just, I understand what it takes to put on a conference and I'm having a great time. So congratulations to the organizers. Um, but yeah, let me say a bit about um, what I and my organization do. Uh, we're kind, kind of new, so I want to say a few words before I get into one of the projects uh, that I'm going to talk about. So we're called Epistia, and as you can uh, read, uh, we're an umbrella organization for projects focused on existential security um, and epistemics. We're based in Prague, and we both run our own projects, one of which I'm going to talk about uh, very shortly. But then we also support um, and provide infrastructure for um, outside projects um, from external um, people or organizations. Uh, so what, like I said, one of the things that I'm going to talk about is uh, our project, Prague Fall Season, that is about global community building. And before I get started, um, has anybody been to Ulkash's workshop on productive disagreements? Lukash said we should define things before we talk about them to um, prevent uh, disagreements. So uh, I want to talk a bit about what even is community building before uh, I tell you how, how I think we did it in the Prague fall season. I think community building is one of the most used terms in this movement. It's how many people spend their time and um, what they're trying to do. And um, I want to speak for a moment very broadly about community building in general, because um, I think in some sense, in one way or another, I've been building various communities for over 20 years now, and only five of those have been in effective altruism and rationality recently. And so I kind of want to think about what we even mean when we build a community um, you know, a group of people who share something, they share a passion, a project, a worldview, um, and we want to have them come together. Um, so this is how I, how I think about it. So to me, uh, community building is about creating opportunities for people to meet, learn, and create new connections, things, and projects. Now, what do I mean by that? So I think when people meet, it's obviously about creating new connections, but also deepening the existing ones. And that can be in any context of your colleagues, collaborators, or your social relationships. I think it's also about providing opportunities for learning um, and information sharing. Uh, those can be specific to that particular community. So in the case of effective altruism or rationality, those are usually the content, the philosophy, the ideas of effective altruism. Um, and then finally, and I think this is a very, very important piece and, you know, relevant to the theme of this conference, getting things done. I think there is an element of creation or building um, new things, uh, new ideas, projects, events, something that wouldn't exist otherwise. Now, um, from the abstract to the more concrete, uh, the actual effective altruism community building, uh, there, I think there's usual specifics uh, that people associate with that. So often it is kind of set in a particular area at a university, in a city, or on a national level. Um, there's examples like EA Anywhere, which is community building for people who are kind of dispersed um, all over, but most often um, it's set in one location. Um, there's usually a graduate, uh, it's a kind of um, gradual process throughout the year that happens continuously with some disruptions every now and then, or depending on the type. So if you're a university group, then obviously you have the holidays and then like new students come in in the fall, but generally it's kind of dispersed um, all year round. Typically there is a strong base um, with some new people coming in every now and then. And because of that, uh, there is often a strong context and culture of the already existing community. Unless you're starting a community from scratch, if your community is, has not, that's not exist yet, and you're trying to start it, that's a particular challenge, which I'm gonna talk about later on because that's kind of what we uh, did in our project. But this is kind of typically what you can expect from, uh, from effective altruism uh, community building. 
So we've defined community building, or at least in, from my perspective. Now, what about the seasons? So of course, there's the Earth seasons, which I think are actually very important. I was born and raised in Central Europe. I've lived all my life with seasons. And then I moved to California uh, for four years. And um, yeah, there really weren't that many seasons, which is interesting how that affects your mind and just like how you perceive time and events in your life. It, it's very interesting. Um, but I don't actually mean the literal seasons um, when I talk about seasonality in community building and in our projects. So I'm going to talk more broadly. Seasonality is basically any kind of time dynamic um, in the process that you're doing. And um, I started thinking about this a couple of years ago, even on an individual level. Um, I do uh, some coaching and rationality instructing on the side for CIFAR. And one of the things I encounter often when talking to people, especially effective altruists or rationalists, is uh, that they're trying to do it all. And they want to have a meaningful job. And they want to have a good social life. And they want to stay healthy and go to the gym. And they want to... Um, have hobbies and, and everything, and then they try to fit in into their schedule. And not only can't you fit that into a day or a week or a month, it just doesn't work. And so this idea of seasonality, where you can have seasons in your life, where maybe you have a time when you're trying to land this new job and this new career opportunity. And so maybe you don't go to the gym as much, but you know that's just a season and you will kind of get back to that at a different time. Or you are trying to make more connections and relationships and have a better social life. And maybe that means that um, your work kind of takes a little bit of a step back. And that's okay because that's the season you're in. And so inspired by this idea that we can prioritize different things at different times and focus on different things at different times of our life, was this idea of seasons in the community building. Um, where... You can have a high focus on something in one time and then kind of a less of a focus um, in a different time. So to kind of give the um, general um, overview of the seasons in community building, I, as I understand it, so there would be a lot of dynamic in time. Um, there would be kind of a high intense uh, uh, pe periods and then there would be kind of slower, uh, more relaxed seasons. Um, it can be on a varying time scale. It could be a week, a month, years. It could be many years uh, sometimes. Uh, some seasons last many years. It could be for yourself as an individual, like I described, but also for groups of people or whole communities. And then there is something that can happen with a season uh, that kind of helps you get more focus and like this new context, kind of like I described um, in the, for example, getting that new job. Or again, like going to a gym is maybe the number five um, item on your to-do list. But if you're in a season of getting healthy and, and really prioritizing your health um, and, um, and um, kind of being fit, then uh, that can kind of allow you to, to really focus on that and make progress. Whereas if it's kind of constantly somewhere on your to-do list, uh, it's much harder to do. Now, from general seasons uh, to the Prague fall season. So um, we started thinking about this project right after EAGX Prague. Uh, so that was May, May of last year, May of 2022. And... Um, it came out of a combination of things. First of all, we received um, some really good feedback on the conference in Prague, and it was um, some uh, reassurance that what we're doing and how we're doing it um, is useful and, and good for people to experience, both in terms of Prague and our local culture there, um, but also our skills and abilities to get things done and make things happen. And then in addition to that, um, We've perceived very strongly for a long time, as many of you may have, the, um, the kind of concentration of um, resources uh, that happens in the movement, where it is uh, kind of mainly focused in the two main hubs, which is Oxford and then uh, California in the USA. And um, that seems both inconvenient for people from mainland Europe. Um, and also, it's just not for everybody. Like I said, I kind of lived in California for a long time. And I decided to move back because I didn't um, want to stay there long term. 
And for some people it works, but for some people it doesn't. And we wanted to provide an alternative to the existing ecosystem uh, to just for people to have that experience. Okay, it, it, what, what would it be like to, to spend some time in a hub that has maybe a different culture, maybe different context, different types of people, um, and have access to similar resources like you do in those kind of major hubs to have um, a lot of interesting people around working on important projects, a lot of events happening, um, and kind of be able to take advantage of all those resources. So the main goal, um, kind of to summarize it, uh, was like I mentioned, uh, create a high concentration of people, events and projects um, in a limited time and space, uh, making it more accessible and inclusive than existing projects and spaces. Um, now, if I break this down a little bit, uh, then the concentration of people we uh, did through um, having a residency program, which was a program that people had to apply for. They were basically in Prague the entire time. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about it um, on a specific slide. And then we had a combination of long and short term visitors, people who were coming in Prague for the season. Um, and th there was kind of a more of an influx, but the, the residents were, were at the core of the program more long term. And then we had various events that happened uh, that people came to Prague for, but they were also an excellent opportunity to come early or stay longer. Uh, some people actually just came for the events, but then decided to stay longer kind of because they uh, liked um, what, what they experienced. And so the people and the events in Synergy um, provided this high concentration of resources uh, that I mentioned. Now at the, uh, at the other heart of the, of the program was the space. Um, this is our um, space that we set up um, for other programs in Prague, but mainly for the season. Um, it's called Fixed Point, um, and it is a villa in central Prague. It has a capacity of about 50 workstations. That is if you need a desk and a monitor to work, but if you can just like hang out on a couch, um, probably 70 or 80 people can be there at a time. It has this large social space for events and many amenities. I won't go into the detail, I could talk about it for a long time, but you can visit the website and, and feel free to talk to us afterwards as well. But I would say that was a very, very important part of the season is having that space where people can spend time, talk to each other, bump into each other, go to events, um, and just create that sense of community um, where even if you don't have any programs, any if you have, don't have any plans for the evening, if you're going to hang out in that community space, you're probably going to come across somebody who you can talk to or there's going to be something happening there. Now, this is um, a summary of the residency program. So we had 27 residents. Um, on average, they stayed in Prague for about nine weeks. And um, our main job was to support them and provide infrastructure for them. So this was mainly in form of housing office and admin support, uh, we organized a retreat for them, and they also had access to uh, T. Barnett, who was coaching throughout the season um, for those residents specifically. Um, I do want to say that we did give them a lot of um, flexibility or a lot of freedom. Um, it really was a very um, diverse a cohort. We had people from animal welfare, AI safety, forecasting, pandemic prevention, community building operations, communications, uh, really a very, very broad range. And um, some people came with very specific projects that they already wanted to work on. Some people were more on a sabbatical and they were kind of trying to figure out what to do next. Um, and so, yeah, it was just this really um, interesting uh, group of people who, who used that time to kind of make progress on whatever they came in um, with as their goals. Now, as for events, uh, the CIFAR workshop series was probably the biggest draw um, of the season. So we organized four workshops. I was a co-lead uh, co of that program as well, um, that we had 137 participants um, and 19 staff and instructors. Um, and I would say that definitely was a, was a big um, source of uh, participants of the season. Um, if I were to summarize the total of what happened before I get into the, to the lessons, uh, every time somebody came to the house, we onboard them on Slack. So that's kind of one of our metrics is 357 people who were in some um, way onboarded on Slack. In terms of people who we were tracking through other means, we had 27 residents, as I mentioned, and roughly 150 people 
through some sorts of visits that we were able to track. Um, and then over 70 various events, workshops, meetups, anything that was happening in the house, whether it be a really big um, talk or workshop or just like a small meditation um, meeting. Um, this is kind of the, the overview of that. This is a, uh, an interesting um, overview just to see kind of the capacity of the number of people that we had in that house that we were able to track. Again, not always uh, people kind of come and go and it was hard to keep track. Um, but from what we could tell, you can see that there was kind of a bit of an um, amping up uh, during the year and then a, like a slow fade down um, in December. And the top peaks are around 60, 50, 55 to 60 people um, in the house. Now, uh, for uh, now for the challenges. So you know this all happened, and in that sense, it was a success because it happened uh, on its own. Um, but yeah, I want to say I want to uh, say a bit more about what that process was like and the things in particular that were challenging about it. So first of all, short timelines. Like I said, we decided to do it in May, and I remember going through that process where. Um, it seemed tight. I, under, I understand uh, planning fallacies. I understand uh, timelines. This isn't my first rodeo. I've organized many things before. A project of this scale, starting to planning it in May for it to happen in September was always going to be tight. Um, the, the question was, can we push ourselves and do it imperfectly now and then have more data and more information and do it better next time? Or do we kind of take a full year and a half to kind of properly plan it? Um, and there was a lot of considerations going into this, um, but we did have opportunities for funding. At that time, it was from the FTX Foundation. And also, I just came back from EEG London, I think, and Will McAskill told me to think big and <laughs> do big projects. And I was like, you know, <laughs> I might, no, this is like my responsibility. I don't want to say that it's on Will. But, um, but I, there, was this, there was this energy about uh, getting things done and doing big, ambitious projects. And so we decided to go for it, uh, you know, knowing that it was going to be... Um, going to be hard. Of course, it kind of depends on the situation. I'm not saying that should always be the decision. And I'll talk a little bit about decision making and, and deciding to do projects later. Uh, but this is how we thought about it um, at that time. Now, uh, the other challenge was uh, that we were doing many things at the same time. So I was starting this organization, Epistea, and that meant that I was doing hiring, onboarding, um, setting up processes and, and accounting. Then we were setting up the space, the fixed point, because we got it as kind of an empty office. So we were buying furniture, buying equipment, setting up rooms and various systems. And we were running this program, the Prague Fall Season. And so that meant organizing events, communicating with participants, just kind of all of those things. And so I would say even one of those would be kind of a challenging task. Two would be, you know, um, uh, hard but possible. Three basically meant that something was always kind of taking the back seat. And that's where I think a lot of the, um, the lessons and the things that we want to do differently this year um, are coming from because you can't do three challenging things well at the same time. Um, and then the final challenge I would say is at the core of what I talked about when I talked about community building and one of the first slides, because people come to the community to meet each other and create those connections. And they also wanna learn and they also wanna create and build things. And so our role wasn't to just provide infrastructure, not just to provide the office space and you guys sort of do whatever. Our role was to also maintain and provide this intellectually stimulating environment uh, that people want to be in and want to want to be a part of. And so again, I would say that is on its own quite a big task to um, stay connected to the community, to talk to people, to um, understand what they're interested in, what their needs are, kind of how can you make um, um, how can you help them with their projects and things like that. And so, that also, I would say, for any community builder, this is probably a challenge. But again, in this kind of pop-up international space um, was even more so, especially given all the other things um, that we had going on. Now, so for the lessons, they kind of flow from the challenges. But in particular, um, I would say 
before starting this pro this project, and that goes for any kind of project that you might do, um, is setting up the processes ahead of time. Um, you know, whether that is admin and technical things like how is invoicing going to work? How are you going to do reimbursements? Um, what is the policy for, I don't know, how do we track our hours? All of these things. Highly, highly recommend to set this up beforehand. Um, it may seem like it's a small thing or it may not matter or it's kind of not what the project is about. Like it's so, I think the lesson is actually something like it's easy to prioritize the content of the project. Like we are here to kind of do the actual project, whether um, whichever organization you work for. And these things seem secondary and not as important. But I would say the lesson here is that they are very important and they will in fact save you time in the long run such that you can spend more time on the actual project. Set up explicit norms and culture. Uh, so again, when I talked about the classic community building, often there is a lot of context and culture that people are coming into. And so they can both kind of sense it out or it's been more established. Um, when you have an international community uh, from people from all over the world that is kind of popped up, it doesn't have a lot of context. And it was in Prague and it was part of our kind of Czech EA community. There was a lot of overlap, but there wasn't enough of the locals compared to the all the visitors who were coming in. And so I would say a particular challenge was um, just understanding what are the norms here? What are the rules? And this goes from very minor things like cleaning or taking care of the space to interpersonal dynamics and community health issues. And I would say we got quite lucky. We only had um, a couple of incidents, which if you think about a house full of people for three months, sort of inevitably, you are going to have some interpersonal um, conflict or incidents. Um, but the lesson there is that we weren't quite ready for it. Um, we, when that happened, we didn't prioritize like setting up processes, like how are we going to handle this? Um, are people actually breaking any rules? Because we didn't say that there were any kind of explicit rules for them to break. And so again, making the getting ahead of this and doing this early and clearly, even if it seems basic to you, because you come from a certain context or culture where it's clear that we um, do things a certain way, I highly recommend um, making it more explicit for everybody just so that they have the information. And also, um, if there's issues, then it's kind of clear why the issues are there because uh, you've established it in the first place. Set expectations and communicate them clearly and early. Uh, this goes mainly for our residency program, which again, we ran on a very tight deadline, but I would say, um, of course, um, ideally, people can sort of work independently and they're going to figure out what it is that they work on and what they need and they can just take care of that. Um, but yeah, I would say we, because we were doing so many things at the same time, it wasn't as much of a priority for us to kind of set clear expectations from our residents. And based on the feedback we received, they would have liked more guidance or more clarity on what we were expecting from the program. And lastly, take care of yourselves. And I think this goes for anybody who's doing community building. Community building is a very, it's a hard job. You are talking to people or in touch with people all the time. That is your job. It's not just to talk to them, but to kind of be attuned to them, to feel what it is that they need. Are they happy? Do, do, can you help them somehow? Is there more you can do? And th this is a lot of emotional labor for anybody. Um, especially for three months with like 60 people in the house. Um, and so that is probably the, the biggest lesson there really is just um, whatever it is that you need to take a break from that, whether that's um, just having alone time, taking breaks, meditating, having clear responsibilities so people don't feel like they have to be on all the time. All of those things um, I think are key to being able to do this kind of for a while and sustainably. Now, we did decide to do this again in 2023, knowing all that I've just shared. And so the program is starting um, in early September in Prague again. Uh, we've already launched a um, expression of interest form and full applications are going to launch next week. At least that's the plan. Um, 
now the place that the fixed point and the organization are kind of basically set up so we can focus fully on the program and we decided to make a few changes to it so now the residency is going to be primarily focused on teams and their work is going to be more focused instead of this kind of really diverse group that we had before we decided to focus their projects on rationality and epistemics and so the applications are going to have kind of more um, more details on that if you're interested what kind of um, topics you can work on when you're in Prague. And then on top of that, you can always come in as a short-term or long-term visitor. And so uh, even, even if your um, area of specialty isn't rationality and epistemics, you can still be part of the season just by visiting and filling out a form first. Don't just drop in, but if you fill out a form, um, we would love to, love to see you. Now, um, what are the conclusions here? And I do want to stop here for a moment because I think this is an important aspect of the getting things done mentality. Um, it is hard as effective altruists to deal with uncertainty. We're only supposed to do the things that we know for sure are measured and evidence-based, that they do the most good, and that is the most effective way to save lives or um, you know, help somebody. And we don't know everything and we don't have all the information always. And it's easy, I think, to do nothing because you don't know what you should do. It's unclear what the best thing is. It's unclear what the most impactful thing is. And so you just don't do anything. And I understand that. Believe me, I absolutely understand that. There is, there, there's also a saying in Czech that's like, well, if you make no mistake, if you don't do anything, you can't make mistakes. But if you do something, you'll almost always make mistakes. And the mistakes can be that the project isn't as important as you thought it was, or you can't really it's not going to work out or you can't do it or there's there's all kinds of things that you're risking by doing things so i kind of definitely want to encourage people to do something rather than nothing but try to make your decision informed um, we don't know everything but we know some things um, have a hypothesis have a have a, um, some theory of change of what you're doing and why Talk to people, uh, find mentors or advisors who you can get feedback on from you, for your things. I do, I've done a lot of projects in my life and people sometimes look at me and they're like, oh, she just like does these, all these projects. For every project I've done, there's about 10 projects I haven't done because I talked to people and they gave me feedback and I decided it wasn't the right course of action. Um, and so just kind of ask yourself, um, are you typically the person who just kind of like rather doesn't do anything and you're kind of more careful and then maybe you want to overcorrect a bit more towards doing things or are you the person who just kind of wants to do every, or does everything that they think about and maybe you want to take a little bit of a step back and get more input and get more information and really think carefully about what you're doing and why and also do something that you think is going to be good for the world. Um, the second uh, conclusion, I think, is really the focus on communication. I would like to, to highlight that both for the people you're organizing your programs for, your participants, your community, and internally within your organization. And then the sustainability and self-care bit uh, that I already talked about. So if you are interested in what we do, you can find us on our websites. Epista is the organization. Fixed Point and Prague Fall Season are the projects. Um, we are also currently looking for funding for all of these. And so if you yourself want to support what we do or if you can connect us to somebody, uh, please talk to me. I'll be hanging around here after the, after the talk. And my final, final, final lesson to you is that if you decide to do anything in this space, you should never do it alone. And so it's so much better, guys. I used to do things alone all the time. And I want to thank my team. They're kind of here somewhere. Uh, so thank you guys for bringing my vision to life and uh, doing all the things that I ask as crazy as they are. Um, so I want to thank them. And I really highly recommend uh, that you chat with us if you're interested. And hopefully, I'll see you in Prague soon. Thank you. Thank you, Irene.